we can go ahead and get started. Um, so first of all, thanks everybody for coming out. I think this is gonna be a really exciting event. Um, just to tell you a little bit about me, my name is Patrick. I'm a med student in Washington, DC. Um, the reason that uh, I wanted to put something like this together is I started a PhD program and I did the first two years and left with masters um, in part because it was clear to me that the incentives of academic science um, were misaligned and a lot of kind of, I think, friction comes out of that. Um, I got to medical school and saw sort of the clinical side of science. And it was almost like the downstream effects of this misalignment of incentives really ended up hurting people who were in positions that they had no control over their own situation. And so for the past couple of years, I've been working on a few projects to try and align the incentives, um, essentially by rewarding researchers for uh, doing research behaviors that uh, are more aligned and help better outcomes and more science be produced. Um, the organization with or which we're with today is Research Hub, where the idea is essentially a Reddit-style forum for anyone to post manuscripts, uh, curate those manuscripts via upvotes and downvotes, and then uh, comment on them via discussion section, where um, all of these interactions are rewarded with an Ethereum token. The idea is to try and come up with some kind of algorithm where we can essentially use a financial incentive to encourage good research behaviors and maybe break down some of the, I guess, uh, frictions that exist in the current system. And so kind of through this journey, I was extremely lucky and I was able to meet Daniel. We've been collaborating kind of on and off for the past year or so. And so um, I asked him to be a part of our first journal club and we're very lucky to have him here today. Daniel, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. So I'm Daniel Himmelstein. Um, maybe you'll see me on Twitter at, at dhimmel. <laughs> and um, I got a PhD in biological and medical informatics. So kind of my research focus is on human diseases and bringing together a lot of different types of um, data, a, a lot of data that analyzes, say, millions of publications all at once, but, but also data from big experiments on, you know, thousands of different cells and, and drugs um, that are looked at all at the same time. Um, but kind of in the background and um, sometimes in the forefront of my research has always been this idea that um, there's a lot of ways that scientific communication could be improved. And uh, so I've done things like advocated for open licensing of um, scientific data and scholarly articles. Um, I'm involved in the preprint movement and um, other things to that end. Uh, so kind of one project I did was the Sci-Hub study, which we'll talk about today. And, um, you know, really at the time, some people knew about Sci-Hub, but no one exactly knew how much Sci-Hub contained in terms of all the scholarly literature. Um, so without uh, maybe let me share my screen now and um, just jump into it unless um, Patrick, you thought there were some other things. Yeah, just one more thing before we get started, just for the people who are kind of filtering in, in now, if you don't mind just uh, putting a comment of, um, you know, if you want to say your name, where you're from and what got you interested in today's event. And then if anybody has any questions that pop up during a uh, discussion, you know, feel free to just jump in and, uh, you know, interrupt us at any point. I think uh, we'd like this to be sort of a collaborative, open discussion. And then um, if you want to, I think it would also be helpful if you have a question to post it to the discussion section under Daniel's paper, because I know there are some people who are interested in this event um, who will be essentially consuming it through that discussion section, which Daniel has been very kind to have already spent a decent amount of time responding to people's questions. So yeah, just feel free to jump in if anything you know inspires you and Daniel, take it away. Yeah, actually, um, I'm gonna paste the two links in the chat. So here I'm pasting a link to the Research Hub discussion, and then I'm posting a link to the manuscript, which I'll be going over. So if you wanna follow along, yeah, I'll screen share, but if you wanna look at it yourself.
Great. So can everyone see my screen? Yep. OK, great. So I, I assume everyone knows what Sci-Hub is, but I'll just show you quickly. It's um, a site where you can go and enter a URL or a digital object identifier for a scholarly study. And it oftentimes will give you um, a PDF back of the study. And a lot of times, is, so unlike a lot of search engines, which limit themselves to work um, that they legally have the rights to share, SciHub actually um, w w tries to share any work. And it even goes uh, to the extent that it will kind of pirate articles or, or infiltrate uh, universities or publishers in order to download articles from their catalog. And um, I guess for people who are not familiar in um, science, there are two main types of publishing. One is open access, where the articles are immediately free for anyone in the world to read. And another one is uh, toll access publishing, where uh, the publishers make authors transfer ownership of the article to them and then uh, try to either charge uh, libraries or individual users for access. And um, that kind of gives you the background, and now I will jump in um, to the to the paper here. So uh, this we published in 2018. I'm actually showing you uh, a version of the paper created with something called Manubot, which is a, a tool I make for writing papers on GitHub. But um, the paper was published in the journal eLife, uh, but I like the interface a bit more here. So we'll just... Um, go off this version. It's very similar. So one of the first things I'll show you, and this is in the introduction, is the history of Google searches for Sci-Hub and the history of Google searches for LibGen. Uh, LibGen is a related uh, tool to Sci-Hub, but it's been a little bit more, I guess, discreet through its existence. For example, the founders of LibGen uh, remain anonymous, where the founder of Sci-Hub uh, Alexandra Alvakian um, is more of a public figure and has, has um, associated herself with the project and kind of um, sh shares more about her motivations. So the site started in 2011, and uh, here is just showing how many people were Googling for it. A and you can see for many years, it was rather obscure and, and didn't have huge interest. Um, but it still caught the eyes of some publishers and some users. So uh, where you see C here, uh, that's when Elsevier filed a civil suit against Sci-Hub and LibGen uh, in the U.S. District Court of the Southern District of New York. And uh, they basically said, well, Sci-Hub and LibGen are uh, doing copyright infringement, and uh, therefore we would like to seize their domains. and um, disgorge the defendants of their profits. And you see a little spike in attention. And actually what this is from is a bunch of news sites covering Sci-Hub and saying Elsevier is suing Sci-Hub. And then people becoming interested in, oh, what is this Sci-Hub? So uh, for the, between 2015 and 2017 or 2018, a, a lot of Sci-Hub's growth was actually fueled by um, publishers attempts to constrain it in US courts. And those attempts had limited success uh, because really it's just a website which is hosted overseas. Um, Alexandra, I believe is in Russia, although she's a Kazakh native. Um, and so, so it's proven difficult to really shut down through legal means. Uh, obviously um, some aspects of the internet are quite centralized and subject to censorship such as uh, domain name registration, which is why uh, throughout its history, Sci-Hub has had uh, many different domain names, such as um, when we wrote this paper, Sci-Hub was available at sci-hub.la, which I, I don't think it is anymore. Uh, so a lot of them have been taken down, uh, but, but I believe this HK, which is a Hong Kong um, top-level domain, um, still is in existence. And usually if you go to Wikipedia, uh, you can see the current lists of domains that Sci-Hub is hosted at. 
And so over time, there were uh, additional spikes in interest, mostly involving the court cases. And then L, which is when um, around the time we stopped the study, is that uh, the American Chemical Society, which is a nonprofit uh, publisher and, and society, um, filed suit against Sci-Hub. And Sci-Hub was ordered in a U.S. court to pay $4.8 million in damages. Kind of one, one thing when Sci-Hub is sued, they, they tend not to really respond um, or contest the charges because there's limited things that U.S. jurisdiction can do to them. So, uh, you know, this money has not been paid that the court awarded. So, so that's a little bit of an introduction, I guess. Um, and kind of what made this study possible is that Sci-Hub released their download logs, uh, as well as a list of DOIs uh, that were in their catalog. So what DOIs are, are digital object identifiers. Uh, kind of most scholarly papers have them. So for example, if we go to our paper in the journal eLife, here you can see the DOI. And so SciHub released data on what DOIs uh, that users were downloading, as well as what DOIs were uh, in their catalog. And um, so we analyzed this and we found, um, well, well, one thing that was important to us is not saying just like the raw number of articles that SciHub had in their database, um, but also what the total number of scholarly articles was such that we could calculate a percent. What percent of all articles uh, does SciHub contain? And so, for example, if we look at uh, journal articles here, which is the largest type of articles, we found that SciHub contained 51 million of the 65 million total articles. And um, by contain, that means SciHub has already downloaded it. Uh, it's worth noting that, say, of the articles that SciHub didn't contain, it possibly could still access and then download, uh, but maybe no one had decided to, or had, no one had requested that article yet, so SciHub hadn't downloaded it. Um, or potentially, as we find, maybe it was an open access article such that users were less interested in um, using SciHub to access it. So uh, we looked in terms of uh, different journals, in terms of how much of that journal was in SciHub's database. And, and we found um, for some journals, it was a very, very high percentage. So for example, The Lancet, which is um, a, a respected medical journal, uh, it had almost 100% of the articles. Same with uh, Nature, same with Science. These are all very big journals. Um, Fewer journal, uh, it, there was lower coverage of certain journals, uh, which I guess is interesting. And uh, there's probably different reasons for each one. One thing we did is we made a website that you can um, browse these results yourself. So if you go to journal coverage, does anyone want to shout out a journal name? How about JAMA? Oh, you got JAMA right ah, there. Ah, JAMA, OK. Yeah, these are ranked by total numbers of articles published. So we have a little visualization which shows you um, for the different years uh, what percent of the articles in JAMA are now or, or are in SciHub as of the, the snapshot. And we also can look at the download logs and see what are the um, articles that individuals are downloading most. So for example, uh, this article about evidence-based guidelines for management of high blood pressure in adults um, was highly interesting. And if you look at it, a lot of the, the top downloaded articles are things of great public importance. And that's probably why they're downloaded a lot. So uh, here's, I, I think, a very important finding is that of open access journals or, or articles in open access journals, 
there were 3 million articles total, but less than half of those uh, Sci-Hub had downloaded and, and stored in its database. Whereas for toll access journals, uh, which oftentimes you would hit a paywall if you were trying to access, Sci-Hub had 85% of those articles. Uh, so I think this kind of shows that Sci-Hub's focus is more about um, downloading paywalled articles and providing access to them than say, archiving all scholarly liter literature. And that's not a huge surprise. It um, corresponds to what Alexandra has said in her blog post that um, her goal is really to give everyone access to articles that they couldn't otherwise get access to. And in the long term, uh, to dismantle uh, toll access publishing. So if we look at uh, coverage by publisher, you can see one of the top ones is American Chemical Society. Elsevier also was highly covered, um, which are, are probably some of the reasons that these two uh, publishers decided to sue. And, and we can look at the coverage by year, and you can see a drop off in recent years, possibly because Sci-Hub hasn't had time to download all the latest articles, or perhaps um, some publishers have found new measures to prevent um, Sci-Hub from obtaining the works. So uh, one thing we did is we collaborated with the libraries at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so UPenn is where I did the study from, and it, uh, it's currently where I'm a postdoc. It's a big research uh, university in Philadelphia, and um, they, you know, spend over a billion dollars a year in research, and they spend thirteen million dollars a year on electronic resources, which is basically subscriptions to journals and eBooks. And um, the library gave us some statistics. So, uh, in twenty seventeen, uh, its users access seven point three million articles. So, such that the per download cost was one point six dollars. Uh, per access of an article. So um, if you know, Sci-Hub is used to download a million articles a day at that cost, that's like a, a million dollars of access. Although um, obviously putting money on access is, is, a, is it, it varies widely between the situation. Um, so kind of we, look, we looked at articles and saw whether they were accessible via the pen library, via um, the OADOI tool, which is now called Unpaywall, and via Sci-Hub. Um, so this is not really a Venn diagram, but I'll explain how to interpret this. Uh, so if you're just using Penn's library, um, uh, you would be able to get access to 80% of paywalled articles in our random sample that we kind of manually checked. So even a university like Penn that is spending $13 million a year is still missing one in five articles. And uh, for these articles, there's not really a way to, to conveniently get electronic access. Um, if you were to use on paywall or uh, previously called open access DOI, which tries to access these articles through legal means, for example, if a version of them is on a preprint server, uh, you would only get access to 15% of these articles. This essentially is the rate of green open access or um, when publishers pay well an article, but it, it's available for free elsewhere. Uh, but if you were to use Sci-Hub, you would get access to 94% of those articles. So at this point, Sci-Hub is already better than probably the, the biggest research libraries at the universities that spend the most. Uh, we also found that you know, if you look at kind of the articles that people are more likely to read, which is judged by the articles that people cite, um, Sci-Hub is really providing access to, to 96%. So uh, most likely, if you want an article that is paywalled and, and uh, you want to access it, Sci-Hub would deliver access. So kind of those were our main findings about the breadth of Sci-Hub. Uh, we did a few other cool analyses. For example, Sci-Hub accepted Bitcoin donations. Uh, Bitcoin is 
a peer-to-peer -peer sort of distributed um, currency. And what's interesting about it is it works globally and it's censorship resistant. Uh, it, so anyone in the world could donate to SciHub um, if they wanted to. And, you know, um, this is a number of different donations I have got every month. Something uh, so when they got donations in Bitcoin, it tended to be smaller amounts. You know, maybe someone donated five dollars, but because of the price rise in Bitcoin, uh, that actually turned out to be quite a lot of money. Let's see. I think I it's some it's somewhere here. So um, basically, SciHub I, I think had withdrawn maybe around four hundred thousand U.S. dollars. Um, and uh, Saheb actually tweeted, it was cool. They, they replied to our study in certain ways, but they said, our information is not very accurate, but I cannot correct it. That is confidential, um, which to me, I took it as there was additional donations they received um, privately that, that you know were not associated with these three Bitcoin addresses such that we don't know about them. Um, so yes, yeah, Saheb is free to use. Um, and how they're financially supported is not entirely known, but some through donations. So one final figure before we, um, you know, chat more is this is the number of downloads per day uh, for the time periods where SciHub has released download logs. Uh, so you can see not only has like attention on SciHub through Google search has grown, the actual usage has grown. And this drop off here is when a lot of the domain names were taken down due to the uh, American Chemical Society lawsuit. Um, but we don't have data for 2018 or 2019, although I, I assume uh, this has continued to grow. That would be interesting data to have. So with that, um, I think it's a good time to um, go to any questions and um, we can also discuss what users have put on uh, the research hub discussion. We've had a lot of, of interesting discussion up to this point. Yeah, so, so if anybody has any questions, you know, about uh, the figures in Daniel's paper, uh, feel free to ask them now. I think if not, no worries. Uh, we can just go ahead to the discussion section. You feel free to jump in at any point. Cool. Okay. So I see in the comments here, freeread.org said, hello, freeread.org from New York. We petitioned in February for open access to coronavirus research and support uh, open source library projects. That's great to hear. Uh, great to have you here. And um, I guess let me just go to your question, which I thought was um, really great and timely. So uh, the question we have here is, um, you know, what role does SciHub play during the pandemic, uh, especially now we have, you know, a lot of people in the public being very interested in uh, research um, to learn more about coronavirus and just to learn more about medicine in general. Uh, we also have a situation where most researchers can't actually go to their university. So for example, I'm not allowed to go to Penn right now. Um, the last day I was allowed to go to Penn was last Monday. I don't even think my ID would work. I can't, I can't go to the library. It's all shut down. So how am I supposed to get access? And, um, you know, there are ways. So for example, um, there's like a, a little bookmark I have that if I click it, I log in and it gives me the um, pen library access. It's like a little bit hard to use on mobile, but, but it is workable. But um, a lot of researchers find it quite hard to get access if they're not on their institutional network. So if they're working from home, it can be uh, challenging to get access. And so I think uh, I'm guessing there's quite a bit of SciHub usage for people uh, looking to get access because they're not at their university. Um, but perhaps, you know, those people would have um, kind of a legitimate access method were it not for SciHub. Perhaps what's more important is the individuals um, who want to learn about um, any of these topics, but that don't have access. And I think these individuals should still be um, 
able to access these articles, especially because these are publicly funded articles. It, it's not like the authors of scientific articles get royalties for their publication. Uh, it's not like musicians who, when they sell a CD or sell um, music on Spotify, are, are, it's actually supporting the music. Uh, in, in this case, I'd argue the scientists actually want their research to be as widely available as possible. And it's just kind of a relic from the way that um, scholarly publishing developed. Um, now, I'm going to get back to answering the question, but I think I left out one important thing when I went over the study, which was really my main motivation, and that's that I want all publishing in science to switch to open access, such that every article is free to read and published under an open license. And that open license would allow things for, like, for us to repost it on Research Hub and discuss it and um, to make translations and uh, to do text and data mining on it. So um, uh, I think Sci-Hub puts a lot of pressure on journals and publishers to switch your business model, essentially because libraries are going to start canceling subscriptions when uh, everyone can just access all the papers using Sci-Hub. And that's still playing out. Libraries still spend a lot of money on uh, access. So it's, it's still to be seen whether Sci-Hub destroys subscription publishing and whether um, other, you know, initiatives that are like kind of government uh, led, like Plan S, um, you know, how those all play together. But I think Sci-Hub is having a big, big effect there. So uh, back to Freegreed's questions. Um, uh, they mentioned that laypersons have expressed dismay, shock, and, and maybe even disbelief that this research was paywalled to begin with. And I think that's a common reaction when like your ordinary taxpayer realizes that they're funding the science and the science is, you know, to benefit the public, but yet they can't read it. And um, it's just really a shame to me that there's no really good reason for why the public shouldn't be able to read it. This is not sensitive information. This is information that we want to be accessible to everyone, but, but just because we're stuck in kind of a, an archaic system of publication, um, it hasn't been. So, um, Free Read asks, you know, what implication do you think? Uh, but, but okay, so some journals have made a lot of articles, thirty thousand articles related to coronavirus, um, open, and, and that is really a positive development. And uh, Free Read, whatever you had to do with that, thanks so much because I, I think that's fantastic. Um, but I don't like that there's that there has to be people begging for access to articles. You know, access to articles shouldn't be. Uh, something you need to ask permission for or that you need to lobby for. It, it should be something that as soon as publicly funded research is published and made available, you should be able to reuse it how you like, um, you know, without having to ask for permission. And e even with coronavirus, you know, if, if you're really researching it uh, from a biomedical perspective, you're quickly going to get to other topics that are not directly coronavirus, but that are still relevant. Like for example, if you wanted to research the ACE2 gene and protein, um, you know, articles there may not be um, open here. And, and research is really a web of knowledge and it's really hard to say, this is essential knowledge that should be free to read and this is non-essential knowledge. Um, you know, that's a hard decision to make. So, oh, uh, great question three. SciHub is just one website. Are you worried that one day it might just go dark? And um, yes, I, I'm, I guess it's a very centralized thing. You know, it's, um, it's really, as far as we know, controlled by Alexandra and, and her alone. And um, in the past, she's done things like cut off access to, um, Russia for, I believe, a week because she was um, annoyed at maybe ha how some Russian scholars treated her. I, I don't know really the um, details behind it. Someone like named a parasitoid wasp species after her, which I think is pretty cool to get a wasp named after you, but she thought it was an insult. And there was some, there's other stuff I don't understand, but um, that speaks to the centralized nature that one person can just shut off access. But um, it's interesting that Sci-Hub uploads their papers to LibGen, which does distribute torrents. So, so, so the papers that Sci-Hub does download end up getting kind of broadcasted and um, stored in a public place and, and kind of 
my main opinion is that Sci-Hub really only needs to exist long enough to switch the business models of publishers. So once publishers switch to open access, Sci-Hub can and probably will go away. Um, I mean, it would still be useful for accessing past articles, but uh, once new articles are all open access, there's not really going to be much uh, use for Sci-Hub. You might as well just go to the publisher's site. And um, the fourth question is, how do you feel about LibGen? Uh, since LibGen hosts things more than scholarly articles, it hosts you know, uh, fiction books, uh, maybe even some com com comic books. It, it hosts some work where the authors receive royalties for that work. And, and so I think that's morally, you know, less, it, it's more murky whether that's justified because in a way it is depriving the author somewhat. But on the other hand, there have been studies showing that pirating doesn't actually decrease revenue because it, um, increases attention to the work and visibility and then more people buy it but you know maybe that's not the case here i, I really don't know um i think that's probably a decision people have to make for themselves obviously I, i'm really in favor of supporting creative content makers and um i think kind of one thing we'll grapple with over the next decade is how to most effectively do that and sites like research hub sites like Hive, which uh, just had a hard fork today and is new, um, are, ta are trying to tackle that issue. Anyways, maybe I should jump back to see if there are questions now. So Daniel, one thing I wanted to touch on, because I feel like a lot of times when there's two sides of an argument, it's helpful to sort of empathize with both sides. So I, I think like the argument from the perspective of for-profit publishers who put up these paywalls say that they you know, bring value to the scientific community through curation by essentially having uh, like an impact factor in order to have a metric where uh, one paper, the quality of one paper can be compared to the next. And then also outside of curation, um, peer review. So I'm curious what you think about, you know, that claim that uh, for-profit journals bring value uh, through those two value props um, just generally. Yes, so um, a minor just correction, like, for profit is kind of irrelevant here. It's it's the model of publishing. So it, you have prof or publishers like Peer J, which are for profit, but are also open access. So the distinction here is open versus toll access. And you are totally right that toll access publishers do provide some value, and that historically and for the last four hundred years they have kind of been a bedrock of science and the way that science is done and and the way that science has developed. Um, but I think. In today's world, we have just a better system, which is open access. And open access is so preferable and, and, and so much better for society that we need to think about how we can get there quickly. And unfortunately, it's been very hard to switch to open access. I mean, like maybe 30 to 50% of new articles are open access, but when are we gonna get to that 100%? And, and it's been hard for a variety of reasons, um, but I don't think you'll find many stakeholders besides publishers who actually say that toll access is a better model than open access at this point. And uh, you, you did mention kind of a lot of the services that publishers provide. Um, one big one is orchestrating peer review. Um, but what, uh, you know, peer reviewers usually are volunteers and even a lot of editors at the journal are volunteers. So in general, almost all of the intellectual work is just given to the journal. And then uh, toll access or subscription journals take that work and, and they they get all the copyright to that work essentially. And, and then they use that to prevent access to ideas. And, and ideas are not meant to be copyrightable, but when those ideas are written down, you, you know, they're subject to the writing, which is copyrightable. And, and so therefore the publishers get to block access essentially to the ideas where a huge amount of investment from the public has gone into um, and a huge amount of uh, volunteer time from peer reviewers and volunteer editors ha has gone into. So it's 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 not a great system. They're getting too much for, for their actual contribution to their article. The, the contribution to the article was potentially minimal. And um, a lot of authors would actually tell you the contribution of the journal was negative. I mean, they tend to have 
very technologically outdated systems. It's a very slow process to get published. It's very frustrating. Um, wh what they do add is they, they add a certain prestige because they have a certain brand name. And I guess you could say that brand name is valuable and helps people decide what research to read. Um, but that brand name can still exist in a world of open access. And um, that being said, I, I think it's kind of all up to all of us as scholars or um, you know anyone to be able to evaluate articles without the brand of a journal. Because if we do that, we can achieve really much bigger efficiencies because publishing can at that point essentially be free. Everyone could just post to preprint servers. So, so we should try to get away from the journal as the primary way of evaluating the importance of, of work. Cool, thank you. So Daniel, you have some questions in the uh, comment section in uh, the Google Meets. So if you scroll over there. Um, ah, great, okay. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, so what makes me interested in open access? Um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think my last answer touched on that. Um, Patrick Lou, is there any uh, parts of this you'd like me to dig into more? No, I think your last answer, yeah, touched on all of that, so, yeah. Cool, and then uh, Free Read, just an update says, yeah, same, the begging felt absolutely in, insane. Uh, you know, when people were dying and, and Free Read was trying to uh, get these coronavirus papers accessible. So um, Free Read, if, if you can post any links, I'd love to read more about um, your experience and, and what you did. Uh, Emma T says, hello, my name is Emma. I'm an anthropology student, undergraduate from Mexico. Well, hey, welcome, that's really cool. Uh, what got me interested in the topic was my thesis, which focuses on open access from the Latin American perspective. From my own experience as a public university student, uh, from a non-English speaking country, sometimes it is quite costly and hard to gain access to class materials. So it's common to get used to, used to not being able to read certain books and text. And I don't think that they should be deemed as normal or okay. Oh, I don't think that should be. Um, I, I agree. And I, I think this is a good point to show one of the uh, questions we had from Carl Erickson um, where this individual asks, are any populations or demographics of people more adversely affected by the standard of toll access journals? And um, here I dropped in a figure from a peer J study, which I wasn't involved in. I, I was a peer reviewer for it. Um, and each of these pie charts show at different places around the world um, the percentage of access. So if uh, the pie chart is mostly filled in with black, that means um, they had a high level of access. Uh, this was focused on ophthalmology, but these findings probably generalize. And is somewhat. the map going down? I think uh, just to show the chart. Uh, sorry, can you not? Do you not see the chart? I can't see it. Can you, Patrick? No, we're not. We're not seeing the chart right now. Ah, no. uh, okay. I see my problem. I was on the wrong window. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so apply what I just said here. And um, what you'll see is outside of really like um, the highest income countries, access tends to be pretty low. And uh, this is even including programs that publishers have to give like free or low cost access to um, developing countries. So even that's called Hanari access, but even with that access, um, it, it can be quite low. So I think there is a big sort of um, inequality and, and different people in the world are affected in different ways and their ability to participate um, in research is affected. Uh, so I think, you know, people at institutions uh, in anything but the highest income countries are really adversely affected as well as just people in the public. And I'm a huge supporter of citizen science and really everyone being able to be a scientist. And if you need a subscription from a, you know, a university library, um, that's a lot more difficult. And, um, you know, I think we need platforms and systems where not only everything is free to read, but you can interact with it such that like if a reader in the general public had a question, they could ask it and 
potentially give feedback, we're kind of wasting the intellectual input of the vast majority of, um, you know, people on this planet when uh, we kind of shut research just such a small percentage of people. Daniel, uh, I know you're, you're a huge advocate of open source software. Do you mind kind of like comparing and contrasting this chart to like how uh, GitHub operates and has sort of allowed anyone in the world to be able to learn from any open source program in order to, you know, build whatever they want? Yeah, so um, let me just say this. I like my computer. It's extremely powerful and it's running all open source software. And, and so how do we get to a point where we can have such great computing? And I, I mean, you know, people still find it frustrating, but uh, I think, you know, software has been developing so quickly. And how did we get to that point? And I, I think one of the main ways is through open source software where um, every project can, is not only like freely available to access and run, um, but also can be modified by, by anyone for any purpose. So um, that's been extremely powerful by letting communities come together online to develop software like Linux or develop software, um, you know, like all the Python packages uh, that say I use to, to make this study and to visualize it. Actually, the visualization was done in R, but um, it, most of science depends on um, open source software. And it's just been uh, developing at such an incredible pace because of GitHub. And actually, we wrote this paper on GitHub such that um, we could do cool things like this. So here is the Spanish translation where um, Humberto the bot got in touch with me and he said, I'm interested in translating your paper to Spanish. And I said, well, first, you don't need my permission because it's openly licensed. But second, I'll help you use um, Manubot on GitHub to make this. So um, he translated it. And then after each paragraph, we have the English original paragraph. So um, we're, we're kind of interested in, um, you know, really opening up scholarship and publishing uh, with models like GitHub. And, and I think if we can get scientific publication and communication to use a much more open and collaborative um, method, we could really have huge dividends and, and just an explosion in productivity and collaboration. So, yeah, I'm sorry if I've deviated somewhat from um, Emma's question, but yes, I think it's not normal nor okay. And um, so let's go to um, the hypothetical scenario. Um, World Open Access Day, January 11th, 2021. Anniversary of Aaron Schwartz's death. Groups of 75 students at universities around the world each buy a one terabyte hard drive and fill it with a subset of Sci-Hub's collection so that collectively they have the full collection of all 81 million articles. They organize a march where at 9 a.m. they walk around to the university library and deposit the hard drives on a table in the foyer. <laughs> Here's everything they say, cancel your subscriptions to the journals and redirect that funding towards research and scholarship. Assuming this was feasible to do, which it is, you just mentioned the torrents, how do you reckon this would play out? Um, I think <laughs> it, it won't have to happen like that where um, people deliver hard drives. So if we go to this website, big deal cancellation tracking, there have been really major cancellations um, of subscription packages by libraries. And yes, librarians tend to be slow to, ad to adapt and, and they don't want to have their users have to um, access articles in a potentially illegal manner. So um, they, they in general won't recommend SciHub to their patrons, but kind of the way I view this as playing out is that First, when cancellations like this happen, um, for example, like when the University of California cancels Elsevier subscriptions, which, which happened last year, they'll get less complaints because people will find it easier to use SciHub than complain. And when that happens, they feel less pressure to continue other subscriptions because in the past, if they made cancellations, there actually would be a lot of complaints because there was no alternative way of access. And, and then second of all, um, we mentioned how Sometimes it's more convenient to use Sci-Hub than like your remote library platform. The statistics that the library keeps will show less and less access is occurring. So um, when kind of academics use Sci-Hub instead of their library, 
the, the library is tracking one less download and is now seeing that they're getting less value out of their subscriptions. Um, by the way, I, I love this hypothetical scenario. And I just want to say, I really hope that we don't have to carry around hard drives of PDFs. The reason being is, is I really dream about um, a, a literature that's all open access such that we can have pre-processed text mining corpuses. So extracting the text from a PDF and like uh, analyzing it in order to say, find all the mentions of COVID-19 or coronavirus is actually a very hard problem. And it'd probably take you uh, one to three years to download all those terabytes and go through all those PDFs and clean the text. So we really need to have systems that allow for one person to do it once, um, or maybe a, an open source project to do it once where people can contribute improvements, but not everyone is repeating the same efforts. And that really can only happen um, when articles are openly licensed. Sci-Hub is not really enough for that because most researchers will be afraid to share uh, text mining results from Sci-Hub. But what Sci-Hub can do is get us to a point where um, journals switch to open access such that for future articles, this is possible. So maybe uh, the next question here. Uh, so what are your thoughts about lay persons misinterpreting the very technical writing of journal articles that require in-depth knowledge to understand? Misrepresentation can cause a lot of problems for science and public health. And while that's true, that's not really a, a unique problem because still lay people can access a lot of articles currently and um, they're free to misinterpret them. They're also free to misinterpret any information on the internet. And I'd rather have them, people seeing the actual original source than misinterpreting a non-original source. I think um, if we really want to fix like viral misinformation and those problems, we need to educate the public, but also we need to give them the tools to educate themselves. And if you say, no, the public can't even see this stuff, um, I think that's just setting setting the general public or the layperson up for failure. And um, again, I don't even really see people making that argument because currently a lay person could purchase access to an article or could get it from the library. You know, they could already get this. It's, it's, um, but, but yeah, they, I think you have a good point that as scientists, we need to try to explain our articles in a way that lay people could understand. And, you know, I think research hub has a way of, writing more general um, purpose, like summaries of articles. Sometimes like Reddit can be helpful for that. Um, eLife has, eLife the journal creates uh, kind of like broader language summaries. So uh, I think that's a good point, but um, the solution is more access, more discussion rather than less. Another question is, um, I feel that the brand of a journal is a very important thing for science as the quality of the research can differ greatly between a big name journal and an unknown small local journal. Scientists have been stopped from publishing to these journals because they were publishing nonsense to get enough publishing done. So there are certainly journals that are really not very good, like predatory journals that don't do any peer review. Um, let's kind of discard those and, and let's just focus on journals that do publish serious work, but vary a lot in terms of prestige and impact factor, which is just mostly, you know, the average number of citations that articles get. Um, co contrary to this belief, a lot of studies have shown that the um, most prestigious journals like Nature and Science and the top journals in, in fields actually publish more false findings. Um, I know there was like a really great uh, study using like protein structures and whether they validated in, in such a way that, um, you know, a lot of the kind of other confounding factors should be adjusted for and found that publications in the highest impact journals actually were of lower quality. And maybe that's really surprising given that, you know, there's more attention on them, but um, some things about the journal prestige system is that oftentimes researchers are kind of encouraged to exaggerate their results, possibly even to do misconduct, or possibly even to have a kind of novel finding, which is less likely to replicate because, um, you know, it, it, 
forcing people to be novel makes people invent ways to be novel that, that are not necessarily true. So um, it's not actually true that the biggest journals publish the best research. Uh, oftentimes though, they do publish many of the most important studies and that could happen under a system of widespread open access. Nature could be open access tomorrow. It's just a shift in their funding model um, as opposed to, to anything fundamental about um, but also I want to say, you know, now preprints are a growing thing. So for example, BioArchive uh, is a preprint server for, um, you know, biomedical knowledge. And a lot of the best studies are being posted here before they go to journals. So in the future, it would be nice if people could be reviewing these studies. And instead of having like two or three reviewers give anonymous feedback that the public never sees, we can have potentially anyone who's interested in it, anyone who's an expert giving public feedback that can be mined to create a much richer and better assessment of a paper. It's, you know, a journal has hundreds of thousands of papers, potentially, they're not all of the same quality, we need to be evaluating um, papers at an individual level. So Daniel, I think another part of this comment too that's worthwhile to touch on is the publisher perished nature of academia, where there's a pressure on scientists to maximize their number of publications in order to have like positive career benefits. I'm curious if you could touch on that quickly and then kind of how you've dealt with that in your own career. Yeah, so I think that's, um, that is definitely a, a factor that the kind of traditional mode of doing things has been published as much as you can, and that will help your career advancement. And I think that's been true in the past, and, and maybe it's true somewhat today, but I don't think it's a forward-looking way to approach a situation because funders now realize that it's a problem. Um, you know, maybe like a very old tenure committee would still apply that, and in some places, those pressures are still there, but I, I think funders are increasingly looking to um, fund scientists or scholars who are more cutting edge, who have made their data open, who have made their publications open, and we're continuing to see science evolve. And so I know at least personally, I think I've benefited a lot by um, sharing more. You, you know, in, in the past, maybe the number of publications you had was the most important thing. But now I would say like your page rank on Google is actually more important because how do people find what an expert is or what a good study is? They usually just, just Google it and being more open, sharing more of your stuff in a free and public way will mean that there's more stuff about you on the internet. And when someone searches for a topic that you're an expert in, you're more likely to come up or, or something that you wrote is more likely to, to, to come up. So I would say, the best thing you can do for career advancement is just be as open as possible. And um, while it does feel like kind of a leap of faith, I think that's probably the way in the future that that um, the most prominent researchers are gonna gain their prominence. Yes, so uh, here's an interesting question. There's a difference between computer science where anyone with a computer can program in biomedical science where you need a lab filled with very expensive equipment to do an experiment. And uh, this is an interesting point, but I would actually say that for so many biomedical questions, the experiments have already been done. The data is already out there. So for example, um, uh, sequencing and uh, gene expression experiments, there are huge public databases that are so big that no one has really been able to analyze all the data together uh, for all the possible research questions. So um, I think there's a great opportunity for people with just a computer to kind of do cutting edge research in a lot of these fields. So in, in fields like genomics, um, you know, a, a large, large portion of the research isn't generating any um, original wet lab analyses and uh, can entirely be done with public genomic data. So while you're right that some of the stuff is highly specialized uh, and needs like lab equipment and, and that stuff will always probably be done by labs or um, other kind of large scale entities. Um, I think we still can have a lot of the work done by people in the public. So just to kind of touch on this too, when I was in my PhD program, one of the uh, researchers in the hall that I was on was working on an automated lab. 
where essentially everything, all the reagents, all the, uh, the experiments would happen via robots. And so I think it's uh, maybe in the distant future, but there will be a time eventually where you can submit a protocol that then would be done remotely. Um, I know uh, there are companies like Science Exchange where essentially you can, uh, it's like an Airbnb for scientific equipment where you can uh, pay for experiments to be done where you yourself don't necessarily have to do them. So I think uh, it doesn't happen now, but in the future, there'll be an opportunity for anyone to have access to the wet lab tool. Yeah, in a way it's a preferable system because it actually makes a way for these biological analyses to be scripted. So it's not like someone doing pipetting by hand, it's an actual program that you're writing that robots are converting into a set of steps. So that would allow you, someone else to like fork your protocol where they change one step and we're able to really methodically um, test every assumption and every kind of operating decision you made. Uh, but, but I think there's still a good point that that will probably be expensive. And um, so, so while anyone may be able to order that experiment, could anyone afford that experiment? So, so maybe what we need is a way for um, anyone to be able to say, hey, I want to do this experiment, please fund me even if I'm not at a university and the funding will go to, you know, uh, this science exchange experiment. That, that would be really cool. I think if we can fund science in a much more granular way, we could get um, a lot of return on that. Let me take this question from, um, we've seen a lot of emphasis on scientists and publishers making COVID-19 articles open access. Do you, anticipate the experience of the current situation will have impacts in the future for publications of medical research. Um, so I don't think what journals are doing in making uh, articles temporarily open will have a huge impact. It's, it's just kind of, you know, once the crisis is over, maybe those articles go back to being paywalled or, or articles on new topics become paywalled. And, and these articles aren't open access or aren't openly licensed in a way that the sort of text and data mining that we'd like to see can be done on them. Um, I, I, it's still a positive development, and I do think that it's waking people up to the situation. And, and, a, and there's a lot of pressure from governments, funders, philanthropies um, that are saying we really need open access for everything. And that's kind of why Plan S in Europe, where funders are saying everything we fund needs to be published with an open license, um, have picked up momentum. And, and so yeah, I do hope that this helps people see the need for that. And I think people do see the need for that. It's really just um, the system will switch overnight if everyone insists on publishing openly, only reviewing for open journals, uh, et cetera. But we just need to make that leap. We, we need to make that jump as a community all together and, and then change can be fast. Yeah, so we're at uh, 4 p.m. right now. It's been an hour. So thank you, Daniel. I mean, this has been amazing. I've really enjoyed it. If anybody else has any last questions, you know, um, go ahead and type them. And then uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up, too. I think these have been a lot of really interesting questions that were posted to the discussion and then in the chat here. So I really appreciate everybody taking the time to fully consider Daniel's paper and sharing your thoughts on it. Yeah, thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. Really great questions. and. Um... I'm, I'm excited for the recording and um, answering any extra questions people have on uh, the discussion.